Hey Bulldogs, Chris Bryant here. In today's combination CCNA and CCNP route video boot camp, we're going to take a look at the IP route command. And even if you think you're very familiar with this command, you definitely want to stick around for this video because we're going to look at some options on it, the fundamental options, especially for you future CCNAs. And for you future CCNPs, what we're going to do is take a look at a value that isn't terribly common, but it's one you better know for the exam. And I think this is really good for you future CCNAs to see as well. So let's go ahead and hop up on the live equipment. I'm going to pop that out of here, and we're going to start with the IP route command. So the very first value in the IP route command is the destination prefix. And I want to give you especially a note here if this is relatively new to you, certification testing that is. One of the most challenging things about it, and it still is for me after 15 years of taking the exams, is that you could be presented with a multiple choice question and they could say, which one of the following IP route commands you know, would do task A, would go to this destination, would be a default route, that kind of thing. And you've really got to have the syntax of certain commands just memorized. I'm not going to lie to you, you just got to have the IP route command down. And it's not terribly complex, but you don't want to be in the exam room and say, well, I think this is a mask and a wildcard mask goes here. You don't want that. So we've got the destination prefix we're being asked for first, and I'm just going to choose this one as at random, 3000. Next, I'm going to be asked for the destination mask. Note that this is a prefix mask. It is not a wildcard mask. So is that a legal command as it stands right there? What do you think? Actually, it's not, because we've defined the destination, but we haven't defined how we want the packets to get there. Now, this is a very big detail, especially for you future CCNAs who might not have seen this a lot. If you put the IP address here, you are putting the next hop IP address. If you enter one of these interfaces, Ethernet, serial, either, excuse me, even one of the others, you are specifying the interface on the local router. So you're either saying with the IP address, here's where I want the packets to go to this IP address. If you specify an interface, you're saying, hey, we're checking them out that interface on the local router and hope they get there. I like to put the IP address, but obviously for exams, we need to know both options. So what happens though, if I put the local router's IP address? Let's see what happens. This is uh, router two serial zero interface. And it's an invalid next hop address, and I love the way the, the router kind of whispers to you, hey, it's this router. Obviously, the exam is not going to be as kind, so we've got to know that's a next hop IP address. So right there, if I put dot three, if that's where I wanted them to go for next hop, then this is a legal command. So it's IP route, destination network, destination prefix mask, next hop IP address, or local router exit interface. Now, let's talk about this distance metric value. Because it, the term there in iOS help is a little bit misleading because when you and I as network admins, when we hear metric, we're thinking, you know, path cost. You know, how much does it cost for us to get there? That's not what we're setting here. What we're actually setting is the administrative distance of this particular static route. Now, this is totally optional. And you may think immediately, like I did, well, why would I ever want to change the AD of a static route? Well, you may have situations where you want the dynamic route to be the one in the routing table, and you want to use the static route as a backup. So let's just say with OSPF we had this IP route 300 slash 8, and we also put a static route there. Well, if we leave the administrative distance at the default, the static route is always going to be chosen because it's got a lower administrative distance, assuming, again, the two routes are exactly the same. So we'd have a little bit of a problem there, except for this distance metric. This allows us to change the AD of the route. And in this case, if we were working with OSPF, what would we have to make that metric to make it just a little bit higher than OSPF? The OSPF AD is 110, so we would have to make it at a minimum 111. Now, the reason I really wanted to show you that is that there is no word distance here. You know, there's no hint. So if you were looking at this in a practice exam or a job interview or on the exam itself, you've got to know what that 111 is there at the end or whatever number it is because the command is not telling you what it is. Now, I know you're thinking, just like I was, you know, again, why would I do this? Can you show me a scenario for it? I can, and by the way, we call this a floating static route. 
And when I first heard that term, I thought floating, you know, floating on what? Well, it's kind of floating out there in space until you need it, basically, is what happens with a floating static route. Now, I do want to show you a scenario where you could use that, but obviously I can't really do that in five minutes. So I have a three-part video uh, on YouTube now, and I also have it on my website. This is in the old days when they wouldn't like you, let you make videos longer than 10 minutes. So it is broken up into three videos. You can search for it on YouTube if you like. I also have the bit.ly link right there. I'll also put it in the YouTube description so it's clickable and you can go out to the main site if you want to and see all three videos there. But it's definitely worth your time if you are a future CCNA, excuse me, future CCNP, but your future NA should take a look at it as well. Thank you so much for taking five minutes to watch today's video. I'm Chris Bryan, and thanks for making TBA part of your Cisco certification success story.